So, Alf, you came to Britain, aged seven. Six. Six, on the kinder transport from Prague in the then Czechoslovakia, where you were born. What do you remember about that experience, and how do you think it's informed all of the, the political life you've, you've lived here? Well, the first half of your question is easier than the second half. Uh, well, I remember, for example, that my father was Jewish, my mother wasn't. He said to his cousins, uh, if the Nazis come to Prague, he's getting out, and they said they'll take their chance, and we learned later, uh, and they were taken off to Auschwitz. So he left almost immediately. I remember we had to tear a picture of the Czech president, Benesch, out of our school books, and, and stick in a picture of Hitler, German soldiers everywhere, so I remember all that. My mother was trying to get permission to leave and was refused, and so she got me on a kinder transport, and I still remember uh, her putting me on the train. I was luckier than most because my father was by then in London and they hadn't all got a parent in, 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 in the UK. Some, some never saw their parents again, some saw their parents only after the war. Um, but I remember the scene at Prague Station, my mother saying goodbye, uh, anxious parents, and off the train went. And, uh, and then a day later we got to the Dutch border. I was one of the youngest on the train and the older ones cheered because they're out of reach of the Nazis, and I just knew it was significant but didn't know why. In fact, I, yeah, I was looking out for windmills and wooden shoes, which is all I knew about Holland. Anyway, we went, didn't see any, it was dark, got to the Hook of Holland, night boat to, to Harwich, and then to Liverpool Street. So I remember all that, yes, I remember. Some of it I remember quite vividly. And both of your parents then were in London? Well, no, no, no. My mother was refused permission, and eventually she did manage to get out, and arrived in London on the 31st of August, which is the day before the war started. So that was absolutely touch and go. My father then died a few months later, so just my mum and me. But I still, I had a parent. Some of them didn't have any parents. And when did you, what age were you when you started to understand and learn a lot more about why you had had to come to Britain and Nazism and what it entailed and about your, your background? It took a bit of time because although I knew I'd come on a kinder transport, I didn't know much more. It was then, I suppose, I suppose 10, 11, 12, I began to understand what had happened and began to puzzle about the significance of it all and uh, got passionately interested in politics. During the war, the uh, Czech government in exile had a school, a Czech boarding school for Czech children, actually in Wales, and I went there for two or three years. And so I was with a lot of Czechs. Uh, again, I was on the youngest. Uh, and um, uh, so there was a bit of Czech, Czech there as well. So that, that bit of your culture and your background yeah. identity stayed? That's right. A bit, well, I came back and so on. And uh, I know, I've been back to Prague since, and uh, I, I, I always got a twinge, twinge about being back in Prague. Particularly we were driving along the road and I said, what's the name of this road? I think I used to live here and I had... It's an emotional twinge. Emotional twinge, yes. My mother, who'd had a pretty difficult time, she always said there was a golden age in Prague, you know, before the Nazis came, uh, when she had a husband and, you know, so on and so forth, and com a fairly comfortable life. We weren't well off, but comfortably off. Uh, and I decided at that point, I can't think of a golden age in the past, you know, I've got to look forward. So in terms of your political career, you've had a long time as an M a Labour MP, now you're a Labour peer in the House of Lords. What are some of the key moments that still stand out? And again, do you think any of it's informed by uh, your arrival in Britain and your earlier life? My high spots have been, A, getting into the House of Commons. I was head of the Refugee Council for about seven or eight years. I was a minister in Northern Ireland with Mo Molum in the period leading up to the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process. That was pretty exceptional. And then the campaigning I've done on behalf of refugees here in the Lords. I suppose uh, one's past always informs one's, one's present and, and the way one looks to the future. The argument on behalf of uh, refugees that one should, one should show humanity towards victims of, of, of what's happened in their country, uh, I think the argument um, does not or should not depend upon the personal experiences of the individual putting forward the case. However, I can't help but say, of course, I'm more emotionally involved. And when I've met, say, young Syrian boys, and they hear about my background and I hear about theirs, although 
I had a two-day journey and they may have had a six-month journey. The fact is we have something in common in terms of learning the language and so on. So I, I get on with them well because we understand each other more. I stood for Parliament before I got in the Commons and I was a Labour candidate in the cities of London and Westminster. And this is this constituency here. And who was my opponent? Christopher Tugendhat. So we had the spectacle of a refugee from Vienna competing with a refugee from Prague for the central constituency in London. And then when I, when I, when I got in the Commons, um, I was put on a public bill committee dealing with the British nationality. And here I was with eight, 17 other MPs as a naturalised Brit, uh, actually legislating on the future of British citizenship. So I thought, what other country would have given me that opportunity? I thought that was abso absolutely, absolutely terrific. I never thought I'd get into Parliament because I thought it wasn't for me as a third language English speaker and, 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 and a refugee and so on. Uh, and in a way, what I say now to refugees is don't hold back because you think your background doesn't let you. Uh, I made a mistake. I, ha I hung back for quite a long time. I said, go for it because, um, you know, you may or may not succeed, but if you don't go for it, you certainly won't get anywhere. So go for it. Be prepared to fail, but keep trying. Do you worry about our democracy in recent years? I mean, we've had successive conservative governments. There have been a number of policies that have been introduced from, I don't know, mandatory voter ID to proguing parliament, which was deemed unlawful, to the Rwanda scheme, which is still going through parliament, but the Supreme Court has ruled is, is also unlawful. Yes, yes, I do. I think it's, it's, a, it's a long way from the sort of Macmillan one nation conservative tradition. Now, I opposed a lot of their policies. Uh, uh, but but we, we, we've gone downhill a lot since then. And although I opposed a lot of Margaret Thatcher's policies, in fact, most of them, because I was elected to the Commons the day she became Prime Minister. But, um, but a lot, although I opposed a lot of her policies and thought they were awful, the fact is, as a politician, she had personal integrity and she believed in something. And since then, we've had several Prime Ministers who believe in, as far as I can tell, nothing except themselves, who have no personal integrity. I mean, frankly, Boris Johnson just lied and he lied and he lied. And Elizabeth Truss, uh, Truss crashed the economy to the point where we're still suffering from, from the damage of that. And then Rishi Sunak is just, just rather too weak, but he's, he's trying to run an unmanageable Tory party. I, I think politics has gone downhill a lot in this country, as I fear it has in the United States. Uh, and I think it's a sad thing because I believe if we want to have a decent society, we've got to have politicians we have respect for. And you can't expect politicians who don't tell the truth and are honest with the electorate. And why do you think policies like Rwanda, which do not seem to be the priority of the public at large, who care about the cost of living crisis, who care about the NHS uh, not, not working, why are they focusing so much on this? I think the government has really lost the plot on this. Uh, you know, people coming by boat in dangerous circumstances, that's awful. But there are better ways of welcoming refugees and giving them a safe and legal passage to this country. We can't take them all. We can certainly do better than we're doing. When I went to the select committee to, to, to Strasbourg, talked to the people from the European Convention and the European Court, they said, it'd be a tragedy if Britain distanced itself because Britain has been a good adherent. The relationship between the European Court and the British courts has been better than those between the European Court and any other countries. Um, and if Britain departs from adhering to European uh, court decisions, then the notorious abusers of human rights will say, well, if the Brits don't do it, why should we? And you're talking about British values and the rule of law, and it's all also been a traditionally a British value that you came to this country in the kinder transport. Uh, for example, Ugandan refugees uh, who were expelled by Idi Amen came to this country. How have we got from that being almost the norm that's been embedded in who we are to where we are now? Look, I, I, this use of the word invaders, 
if we express hostility to people who are coming and they're fleeing for safety, I always argue we've got to get public opinion on side about refugees. When public opinion is aware of the situation, they are a bit on Ukraine because we've seen more television cameras showing what's happening in Ukraine. But public opinion doesn't see anything now about the Taliban, what's happening in Afghanistan. They don't see much about what's happening in the Horn of Africa. They don't see much about what's happening in Syria. <laughs> and because they don't see it, they're not aware of the terrible circumstances which force people to flee for safety. That's the bottom line. My very last question is, if there was one thing that you have learnt throughout your public, personal life, well, what is it that you think might be interesting to share with other people so they can learn from it too? Uh, I, think one, one, uh, I think one has to believe in something. It's no good being in public, involved in public life and not, not have any beliefs at all. One has to have some beliefs which, which will steer one through the difficulties so that one says, this is what I actually believe in and this is what I'm going to seek to achieve. Thank you, Alf, for your time. It's a real privilege. Well, thank you for your interest. Thank you for your question. Pretty good question, I must say. <laughs>